Okay, it looks like our our attendee number has slowed down a little bit. I think most people are here with us. Welcome everyone. My name is Abby. I'm with the Gray Muzzle Organization. I'm joined by my colleague Amanda um, and we also have Dr. Mary Gardner with us and we're, we're so thrilled to be able to host her presentation. I want to give you just a little bit more background about Dr. Gardner. She is very passionate about geriatric animal care. She's a veterinarian and a co-founder of Lap of Love Veterinary Hospice, which I saw just through some of our social media posts some of you were very familiar with um, and had even worked with. So that's, that's really wonderful. Uh, Lap of Love is a nationwide practice who has more than 120 veterinarians, and they provide in-home hospice care, euthanasia, end-of-life care, and they also have a slew of resources on their website, um, which I'm sure she'll mention later. Dr. Gardner is a published author. She's also co-editor of the textbook Treatment and Care for the Geriatric Veterinary Patient. She travels the world speaking about geriatric medicine, assessing quality of life, veterinary hospice, euthanasia, and caregiver burden, which is probably something that we don't talk about enough. She graduated from the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine, and she was also awarded the Angel Award, and that's, uh, it recognizes the human-animal bond. Um, and she also received the Alumni Achievement Award from the University of Florida in 2016. I joke with her, Amanda and I went to Florida State University, so we don't, we don't hold that against her. We, you know, we still think she's very accomplished. Um, so, Dr. Gardner, thank you so much. Um, I think it's very obvious you have a special place in your heart for our senior and geriatric pets. And without that, we'll, we'll turn it over to you. I do. Thank you, Abby, so much. And thanks for, for giving me the opportunity to do this lecture um, and, and presentation to families that I know are going through such a difficult time, wondering when is time to say goodbye. Um, and there's a lot of questions around the decision that, that you may be facing. And I, you know, I, I understand it from both a veterinarian's perspective as, as well as an owner's perspective. But you were right, Abby. I do love my gray muzzles. Uh, there's nothing better to me than a, uh, a weak and wobbly dog, a skinny old cat, and, um, and the stories that they, they impart on our lives and how amazing that they be, you know, can become a part of our family. And um, when it does come time to say goodbye, it's, it's one of the most difficult decisions that you will ever have to make. And, and even us veterinarians sometimes have a hard time helping families through this. And um, because you, you know your pet best, you know uh, what makes them them, you know what maybe some signs of, of change in their personality and, and things like that. But yet, still with that being said, it's the worst decision you will ever have to make. And sometimes we get we get blinded by some of the things that we see, we're just confused. So I hope this presentation will, will help you through this, um, through this journey as you're, uh, as you're maybe assessing the quality of life of your own pet, or maybe you know somebody in your family or your friend network that has their own pet and, and you wish to help them because maybe they're not seeing the things that you as an outsider will see. And I, I get that asked often, is like, how do I help my brother-in-law because he loves his dog so much, yet he's, he's just not seeing what we're all seeing. So it's definitely something that um, uh, so many people can, can take some information and, and help others. So without further ado, I'm gonna get started. And I wanted to uh, actually start this presentation with a discussion of one of, my, one of my favorite patients, and that's Duncan. Duncan um, was a red Doberman, a, a large one, about 110 pounds. He was adopted when he was a senior. So um, I do love those you know, geriatric dogs and, and cats. And, um, and I know that this is, this is the month of November, which is adopt a senior dog month or senior a pet month. And so this family did adopt him when he was a little bit older. And now um, during the story, he's about 12 and a half years old. But I really wanna understand what makes Duncan Duncan when I'm helping evaluate the quality of life of our family. And, and just to back up, at lap of up, so, so so much of our hospice equipment revolves around understanding that pet, understanding their personality, understanding maybe their home environment, maybe there's other pets in the house that they're dealing with, the caregiver, you know, the family dealing with them. So um, we are doing these assessments of quality of life in the homes, which is so great because we can see them in their own environment, which is a little bit different than when you hear taking videos or, or having a really good diary of your pet's day, daily life uh, to give to your veterinarian would be super helpful. But in Duncan's case, here's a little bit about him. So he loves to hunt moles. He prefers salmon flavored foods, like orthopedic 
had long box and hugging uh, and then liver treats. He's an aggressive drinker, and I will show you what that means in a little bit. So he, he drinks similar to like a water buffalo, and he's got an adoring mom or dad. Um, he is, uh, at, a, at the age of 10, he started to do throat cleans. So it was a little bit like, <clears throat> um, not really a little cough, but just more of a throat uh, clearing. So with Dobermans, one of the things that we worry about with Dobermans is, is uh, heart failure or heart disease. So we actually, uh, or the, the family uh, did a cardio workup and everything turned out to be actually normal for Duncan, which is good. But what they, ooh, I heard a message, my audio is not good. Yeah, Dr. Mary, I was gonna say, it's, you're cutting in and out just a little bit. Um, it, it seemed to have come out of nowhere and then it corrected itself and then it happened okay. again. Um, Let me see. And I will put in my earbuds. That may help a little bit. Yes. Technology <laughs> likes to keep it interesting for us. And you guys, I forgot to mention in the beginning, um, please use your chat box. If you have questions, Amanda and I will be keeping tab on the questions and we'll ask, um, you know, if you have kind of content related questions, we'll ask Dr. Gardner those at the end. Um, but just do just please keep in mind, um, like she mentioned, this is a very hot topic and personal topic. So we realize that some of you may have very situation specific questions and we probably can't get super specific, um, but you know, we'll do our best to address things at a high level um, at the end of the presentation. So thank you, sorry to interrupt. Um, no, and, and please do, and, and it's hard for me to read chats live, so I'm glad I checked real fast. Does this sound sound better now? It sounds good now, yeah. Okay. Hopefully don't yeah. Don't, don't feel don't feel bad to interrupt. So that's fine, and I'm sorry um, that it that it happened. So anyway, with Duncan at about 10 years old, he started to have this this mild cough or clearing of his throat. So with, with Dobermans, we always worry about their heart, unfortunately. So they went to see the cardiologist, and everything's normal. And that was that's what human L means. However, he was diagnosed with lunge paralysis. So that's basically just um, a paralysis of of the larynx which can affect uh, a pet's voice and some other things. Oh, it says audio is still bad. Hmm. I don't know, is your internet connection okay? That's what it seems like to me. Um, well, let's see here. Oh, someone had a suggestion. Maybe if you shut off your video for right now, maybe while you're doing some slides, yeah. maybe we can do video intermittently. I will do that. How is that? Let me do that. Okay. really want to keep hearing more about Duncan. <laughs> I know. All right. How's that? Is that a little bit better? Yeah, it's good right now. Okay. Yay. Yay. All right. So, <laughs> all right. So just imagine me getting very excited over some of these slides. How's that? Um, uh, okay. So he had laryngeal paralysis, which is a, a very common larger breed dog issue. So um, there is the, it's not really a cure, but one of the fixes that we could do is surgery. Surgery is what they, um, one of the surgeries is called a tie back, where you actually tie back half of the larynx. He's got um, this, this drinking problem I talked about. So I will show you some of these videos of Duncan drinking. He will stick his schnoz in the bowl and then. <laughs> So then he drank, which made it a little bit concerning to do this type of surgery because the side effects or negative that could happen is they, they aspirate, we call aspirate, aspirate bone here, they aspirate either food or water or dirt or anything like that um, because half their lingering is tight. However, the problem is his breathing start, started to get worse and worse. And so that's what he sounded like. Um, I hear that the audio actually works. Oh, boy. I'm not sure why sometimes it sounds fine and then it gets garbled. Dr. Mary, do you have a good internet connection? I do. I have a great okay. internet I, connection. I'm so I sorry. I don't, I don't know if it's an issue with Zoom. I don't know what it is. I just stopped sharing for a quick second just so that I could see. Okay, well, yeah, I don't know if it's Zoom or not, but 
I'm going to continue to share. Let me just reshare my slides. It definitely just comes in and out. <laughs> uh, this is a shame. Um, you know what? I will just, I'm going to just move my body to a little bit of a different area. I've got high, high, you know, fars, but let me just move and see if that's helpful. How's that? I can just adjust myself real fast. I'm going to go into this room and see. So um, I'm just going to keep on talking. And Abby, please interrupt me if you think I should try a different, different location. Will do. Okay. Um, so the owners, though, decided to do surgery. And um, the surgery is a, a bit of invasive. And he was you know, about 10 years old. But um, he did have a little bit of an episode of aspiration after his surgery. However, he recovered like a champ no further problems and he went back to his normal life which was mole hunting in oregon and just hugging people and all his liver treats um how's the audio right now it Can sounds you... great yeah. okay good so maybe just moving a little bit has helped or the wi-fi gods were listening to us <laughs> <laughs> okay so all is good for about two years um and he went back to his normal life i'm gonna read this chat real fast as as i move along but um, here's, his, here's his walking though. If you guys can see this video, this little toe drag, see a little toe drag. So um, that's actually uh, called polyneuropathy. So with, with laryngeal paralysis, they can follow up with some, what we call LARPAR, or sorry, um, polyneuropathy, which is uh, a little bit of a, of a neurological problem. So uh, he, he also did have some arthritis. But he was put on some um, anti-inflammatories, pain management, some Chinese herbs and everything. So this is Duncan's pharmacy with just his mobility. So as you can see, it's starting to get a little bit big. And that's what a lot of our caregivers go through is that as you get older, we need some nutraceuticals or some pain management to help them and, and it can get to be a challenge to, to, um, to, to do so much medications. So um, also what was recommended is that he did acupuncture. And so he did that about every two weeks and he was a wonderful patient, as you can see here. So pets tolerate this so well, believe it or not. However, something started to happen with Duncan and, and something just wasn't right. His breathing started to have more effort. He was coughing more, just less energy. So our concerns at the time were that he did have this aspiration pneumonia, which is a side effect of his, of his disease and the surgery. Maybe the surgery didn't, um, you know, had a failure, so tie back failure. We always worry about hearts in these Dobermans, and maybe it was just something new that we hadn't un uncovered yet. So unfortunately, he did end up seeing a cardiologist where he had something called dilated cardiomyopathy, so an enlarged heart that didn't work so well. He had arrhythmias and thickened valves. And here's Duncan in, uh, in his car ride. The, the owners had a little minivan that they outfitted for him and off to his cardiologist appointment. So they had to add some more medications to his current drug list. So uh, these are um, the Lasix and the Mixilatine and Vetmedin or, or, cardi or cardiac drugs. And um, so this is just adding on more and more medications. And these drugs had to be given at certain time intervals, which didn't always correlate with the time intervals of the other drugs. So our concerns now is that he would have arrhythmias, which would lead to sudden death. And... Um, and that's something that, you know, uh, I, I'd like to, to prepare owners for is that I know many of us would, would rather their, their pets fall, fall asleep and then pass in their sleep in their beds. Um, but there may be the situation where there's, they're just running around of all of a sudden that he passes due to his disease. That doesn't always happen in all diseases, but due to his disease, that is something that could happen. Or his disease leads to heart failure. And so heart disease... Um, can end up eventually leading to heart failure, which, which is a, a, a filling up of the of fluids in the lungs, and that could lead to respiratory distress. And it's very important to understand how, how a pet is going to live with that respiratory distress and also how they will pass from it. So when I started seeing Duncan for hospice, his appetite started to waver, so he wasn't eating as much. His energy was getting you know, poor. He was now starting to have diarrhea. He was difficult to, to get all those meds down him. So they were trying everything from cottage cheese to cheese whiz to um, cat food. He was also PUPD. That means he was peeing and drinking and peeing a lot, especially up at night. So this is a 110 pound Doberman and the medicines that they had to give him caused him to drink a lot and also then pee a lot. So um, 
that is a very large puddle to deal with every single, you know, every single day. And he needed to be let out every four hours. If he was not let out every four hours, the family would come home to massive lakes around the house. And I don't know about you guys, but having, you know, a, a lake of pee every single time when you come home is not always conducive to, um, to living in the home. And, and this happens a lot. So we had to try to manage that. Uh, some of my concerns was just the difference between mom and dad. They both had different uh, beliefs and mom traveled a lot actually. So dad was the primary caregiver. And we tend to see that where one person might be taking care of the pet more than the other. So when they're asking me when is time, I have to understand what are, what are they willing to do? How far do they want to go? How do they want the end of life experience to be? And so for mom, she wanted to make sure she tried all the options, uh, but she knew she would not let Duncan go into heart failure or into respiratory distress. That to her was the worst way that he could go. And so she did not want that. Dad, however, wanted his boy to go like a quote, warrior. And so we had to figure out what does that mean for, for Duncan? And so he's like, listen, he hunts, he, he mole hunts, he protects the house. He's, you know, he's, he's just so energized and, and loves to run around and make friends with people. And, and he's like, and if, and if he turns into a dish rag, then I've done him disservice. And I do not want to go so far that I felt like I've, I, I, you know, waited too long. So he wanted no regrets of, of waiting too long. So I could kind of understand that. And so when it's time for Duncan, and that's where then our story continues. And I'll get back to Duncan. Uh, however, this is something that, that veterinarians will be asked every single, every single week, maybe even every single day at Lap of Love. We get asked this a few times a day, is when, when is time? And so um, this is a very subjective question and answer, actually. And so when helping a family, I'm going to look at four different categories uh, for the pet. First, I want to understand the ailment that that pet has. Are, they, are we dealing with mobility issues? kidney failure, heart failure, maybe cancer, so or cognitive dysfunction. And I'll touch a little bit on some of these. So what ailment and, and how will they pass from that ailment? I want to understand the pet's personality. So Duncan, what makes Duncan his warrior? And, and also, is he going to tolerate some of the treatment options that, that we're presenting with him? So is he, you know, is he not taking his drugs? Is he, you know, is he not, um, if, if he happens to have a mobility issue, does he not want to wear a harness? Things like that personal beliefs of the family and the family members might be different and not aligned totally. And then also the budgets within the family. So stepping back to that ailment, mobility issues is so common in our um, medium to large size dogs. With that being said, um, it's astonishing how many cats actually have mobility or arthritis, mobility issues or arthritis. It's just not as um, seen than with dogs because dogs, we take them out for walks. We, you know, they run around outside. With kitty cats, they're lying in a sunbeam or, you know, laying on our couch. So we don't see them moving as much. Uh, so it's very important to, to have a close eye on your cat. You know, are they, are they not covering their litter box or their, their litter um, appropriately? Are they, you know, going outside their litter box? Because maybe it's difficult for them to walk in the sand. Maybe they're not jumping up on the bed as often. So um, uh, anyway, so a dog or a cat with mobility issues, the, the, the conversation I'm going to have with the family is very different than a pet that has something that is um, going to cause them respiratory distress. So um, something, uh, something like heart failure or um, cancer that spread to the lungs or um, maybe a collapsing trachea or something like that. So, uh, and, and managing those symptoms is going to be very different for, for the pet and for the family. And again, and I'll touch on it in a little bit, is also how they will pass from these diseases. So I'm going to um, look at the ailment. Again, like I said earlier, the pet's personality. So how well are, are they managing with the, with, the, with the tools that we're using? This is Rocco. He had something called degenerative myelopathy, which is a very common uh, uh, problem in German shepherds. And his family was willing to try a wheelchair. And so not all uh, dogs are going to tolerate a wheelchair or do very well in it, but Rocco did. And he had a wonderful uh, yard that he could run around in his wheelchair. And so um, that was something that family could do. But what if Rocco lived in a, in a apartment building three stories up with no elevator? This is not something that the family could, could then manage uh, well. So the pet's personality is important. The personal beliefs are going to be very different for, for each family, whether it's cultural, religious, personal, or even the use of the pet. And some of you may say, what? The use of the pet? But there are, there are some pets that are, are more farm dogs, let's say. And what happens if you have a mobility dog that, or a dog that's you know, usually 
purge the sheep and now he's got arthritis and he can't even do his, his job. And then he gets anxious because he wants to go herd those uh, sheep. So we're going to look at the personal beliefs of, of everybody involved and, and try, to, try to get aligned. The good thing about helping families is that there's one thing they always have in common, and that is that they don't want their pet to suffer. Now we have to though agree on what does suffering mean? And that could be a little bit of a challenge. Next category is uh, looking at all the different budgets. So there are four budgets in life. Uh, and the first is financial budget. Can the family afford the care that is needed for this pet? Not every family could afford the tieback surgery like, like for Duncan. Um, Duncan's family used care credit to help pay for that. But all of his medications were, were expensive. He's a 110 pound dog. So that's, the, you know, they can get costly. Um, but not, not all diseases require a lot of financial commitment. Um, so maybe, maybe it is a, a kitty cat with cognitive dysfunction, which is sort of like dementia. And so there's not much we're going to provide in, in terms of medications. It's more of just managing, you know, dealing with their, their symptoms. But is the financial budget um, uh, healthy, if you will? The time budget, I, I mentioned Duncan had to be let out every four hours. Um, and then also his medications were ha had to be given every six hours. So I don't know how many of you have jobs that you could leave your job and come home every six hours to give medication, but not everybody does, or even every four hours to let Duncan out. Luckily, his dad worked from home, so that wasn't necessarily an issue. The next budget is the physical budget. Can you physically manage? Um, now, Duncan's a big guy at 110 pounds, but I, I helped one family with a, a 20 pound Sheltie and the woman felt so bad, it had arthritis. Um, and so she couldn't, she couldn't lift the dog up to go outside. And she says, I have rheumatoid arthritis and it just, it, it hurts so bad to lift up my dog. And she's like, and now I feel guilty about that because I, she had physical limitations. So she couldn't handle, her, you know, care for her pet. Um, and then the last budget is the emotional budget. So are you emotionally tasked for, for dealing with, um, uh, with dealing with everything that's, that's going on, whether you've got stuff going on in your home, in your, in your personal life, in your work life? Um, maybe this pet is the last living link to someone very important to you and you emotionally can't let go. That's one end of the spectrum. And on the other end of the spectrum, maybe you, you've been through this before with another pet and you felt like you, you went too long last time. So the point of these budgets is that at any time, if any one of these budgets is zero or very close to being zero for a family, I support their decision to say goodbye. So if they can't financially, time-wise, physically, or emotionally manage their terminally ill or very geriatric pet, then I, then I support their decision to say goodbye. And it is not what I would do because maybe I can physically handle a big dog like Duncan, but not everybody can. So it's not up to what, what I can do, but, but what can the family do? And no judgment because we are all so different, right? So the budgets are important to think about. And so as you're assessing your own quality of life for your pet, think of these because these are also the quality of life for you. Um, and next to quality of life for a pet, the next number one reason why people will have their pet euthanized is because of caregiver burden. So um, that becomes a big issue as well. And so th these, these four categories come into play. Uh, the next, um, conversation I'm going to have with a family is about the disease classification. So um, what this means is the disease, the, the major disease that they're dealing with, is the, is the end going to be very imminent, meaning it's going to happen very quickly, or non-imminent, non meaning it's going to take a very long time for the, for the ending to come. And, and what I mean by the ending is, the, is, their, is their death. And I hate to just talk about it like this, but we have to. So um, in, in the imminent ones, these, these are the diseases where you have to make a decision fast when the end comes. And this would be any disease that will present itself with respiratory distress. So like I mentioned, heart failure, um, cancer in the lungs that have spread to the lungs, uh, collapsing trachea, things of that nature, where your pet cannot breathe, their passing is going to happen very fast and, and also... Um, it's going to be very difficult for you to watch if, if natural passing is, is what you're electing. So this also will not provide you time to, to have a very peaceful euthanasia. The goal at Lap of Love is a peaceful euthanasia surrounded by friends and family that love that pet. And if we have an imminent disease, then we have to actually make that decision maybe sooner than later because we know that if we wait too long, 
it will most likely end in a, in a visit to the emergency clinic. And so I'll have some families that say, mm, Dr. Mary, I want every last second with my pet. I do not want to, um, I do not want to give up one extra day. And I'll say, okay, but let's talk about where your emergency room clinic is because we need to know the route to get there and, and when it is to, to get them there. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum is the non-imminent diseases. And so these are ones that take a very long time uh, where the pet may have it for years, the disease, and also the passing from that disease could take a very long time. So a couple of examples is um, kidney failure. So cats with kidney failure, which is so common in our cats, they actually could live for many years with kidney disease. And then as it progresses and gets worse and worse, some of the signs that we'll see are, are uh, you know, vomiting, because this is toxin builds up in, in their bloodstream, uh, or oral ulcers, they'll, like I said, they'll vomit, they'll, they'll just feel icky, they'll feel sick. Um, or another disease that's, that's a very long standing disease is cognitive dysfunction. And 50% of dogs over the age of 10 have some level of cognitive dysfunction. So this is like doggy dementia. And, and cats get this too, by the way. And so they could be panting and pacing and drooling all over and very anxious. And so this could, this could take years. Um, and, and, and by the way, they may not pass from the dementia. This is something that a family then finally cannot manage anymore. And so I divide this to help families know when to pick the time, which means we may be able to, to, to plan a little better for these non-imminent diseases. Another non-imminent uh, could be mobility. They could go for a very long time uh, versus the imminent where it's a, it's a very fast uh, progressing disease. And so I want to make sure owners kind of um, take that into consideration when they're, when they're planning because a lot of times families will call us at lap 11 and say, I just want to be in your system. I just want to know, you know, what, when can I call you and can you guys come any time of the day or night? And so we have to have a very, um, uh, you know, very important conversation with them that we are not 24 seven. And again, it, it, if you're calling at 2 AM, it is because your pet is in distress and, and um, the best option may be actually to take them to the emergency room. So when is time? And I, when I'm helping families, I'll say, you know what? There's also just these three phases where the first phase is the quality of life is good for both the pet and the, and the owner and the family. They're, they're managing caregiving well. And so I, as a veterinarian, may not feel comfortable euthanizing that pet. And so to me, I'm not, I'm not comfortable. On the very opposite end is where active suffering is constant. And, and that, to me, as a, as a veterinarian, I have taken an oath that I will stop and prevent suffering from happen, happening. And so if I'm presented with a pet that is active suffer, that is in an active state of suffering, we must make a decision. Um, and I know that it can be very difficult, but, but my, my role is the advocate for the pet. Now, somewhere in between is this very large area called the subjective time period. And that, um, and that is where the majority of our families are, where they're like, I don't know, I don't know if he's, I don't know if he's too painful. I don't know, how can I tell? And so uh, I also like to call this the roller coaster. So you will be on a roller coaster and, and where you have good days, bad days, long runs of bad days, long runs of good days, really high highs and really low lows. Um, so the point of this, though, is that the majority of us that are dealing with the terminally ill pet or very geriatric pet will be in the subjective time period. And um, I, I let all the families know that I help, that at any time, if your pet is in the subjective time period, I support your decision to say goodbye. You might be closer to the quality of life is okay, or you might be further towards the act of suffering. But at any time, if you want to make that decision to say goodbye, then I, then I support that decision. And it doesn't matter if I would keep going. And people have asked me, what would you do? And so I have to kind of have a conversation of what's going on in their home. But at any time, I support your decision to say goodbye. You know, that has helped me as a veterinarian that are, that are, that's doing euthanasias not feel so depressed over some things because, um, or, you know, a, a lot of people say, isn't this difficult for you to do? And the moment I realized that, that it's okay to say goodbye before they actually ever hit active suffering, then I, then I actually can, 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 can be okay with this decision. Because none of us on this call or in your homes or wherever, none of us want our pets to active to actively suffer. So if we could do it beforehand, then 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 I'm okay. Um, so next slide. My little pointer is not working well. There we go. Uh, some of the common symptoms that I'll manage with uh, in hospice with quality of life is mobility. Again, that's the number one thing that we see. Hydration. A lot of times pets. 
um, aren't going to drink towards the end or their appetite decreases. And this is very upsetting to families. This is one of uh, the, the number one reasons why people elect for euthanasia when their pet has stopped eating. And there's a saying in human hospice that I think will help a lot of you, is that food and water are for the living and the body won't eat or drink for a future it knows it doesn't have. And so I don't encourage owners to force feed or force um, hydrate a pet. Giving sub-Q fluids to a cat with kidney failure or something like that, that's, that's okay. But, but syringe feeding and syringe hydration um, is really only appropriate in certain situations. And when they're towards their end of their life, I, would, I want them to eat on their own. And uh, so that's just something to think about. Hygiene is really important, especially with these mobility guys, these dogs that are mobility issues, is keeping them clean. And um, they, a lot of times they might be urinating uh, around the house in their bed, things like that. Happiness, which to me is the opposite of, of suffering. So are they still happy? And then also we want to manage their pain. So, so are, they, are they in pain? And this is where a lot of times it's, it's difficult for us to understand when is a pet painful? A lot of people ask me this. And by the way, this is a whole other webinar to go into this, but I'm going to break it down into three types of pain. There is um, the type of pain that we all can appreciate, and that's basically like arthritis. So, um, you know, you've, you've got arthritis, you've broken your leg or something like that, where that's pain, and that's the, that's the sensation of pain that we, that, we all, that we all can appreciate. The next type of pain is disease or malaise. So, uh, for instance, kidney failure, organ failure like that, or liver failure, or maybe even um, end-stage cancer, they're going to feel bad. They're going to feel sick. The word disease is dis-ease. So um, I'm actually getting over the flu. And so a couple of days ago, I was in bed with the chills, just feeling awful. I wasn't in pain, but uh, you know, from like the number one type of pain, but I was feeling horrible. And so, um, so that's just a malaise feeling. So this is, again, your kidney failure, your liver failure, um, maybe even some, some, uh, um, some uh, cancers. The other type of pain is anxiety or distress. And so um, this is cognitive dysfunction. This is maybe any respiratory distress. So um, it's not just black and white for us to see pain in pets also. So a lot of times, you know, pets don't, don't um, show their signs of pains as easily as we do. So if I have an infected hangnail, I make a big deal about it, right? If I've, if I've stubbed my toe, it's like, oh, and I can't walk. So a dog or a cat, like unless it's acute, when they have an acute injury, everybody knows they they might even snap at you. But a chronic pain, like they don't they don't know the benefit of 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 um, complaining. <laughs> so we know the benefit of complaining, but dogs and cats don't. So you might have a cat that's sitting there in in with a lot of mobility issues or or maybe not feeling well, and you may not know that. But a lot of you are very much in tune with your pet. So there's some signs to see, maybe different, obviously, activity changes, but even just the position of their ears, their face may look tense. They may be licking their lips a little bit more. So that's, a good, that's something to look at for oral ulcers or feeling nauseous is that they're licking their lips. Maybe with a dog, they're actually licking their um, wrists or their, or their um, ankles more. So that way we might think there's some arthritis there. So there's a lot of different signs that we can look for, for for pain, but it's not always easy. So I understand that this is a this is a hot topic in of itself, but I hope breaking it down into those three categories that you can understand that there's not just the, the type of arthritis pain, but anxiety and distress is very painful. So do you always know when it's time? And this this bothers me uh, so much when people say, don't worry, you'll know. You guys, you will not know an exact day. However, with that being said, the time that you will know is if your pet is actively suffering. However, again, like I mentioned earlier, none of us want our pets to actively suffer. So it's kind of hard for us to, to know when it's time before, that, before we see that. Even as a veterinarian, I myself don't always know when it's perfect time for my own pets, right? Because I'm a mom first, a vet second. Is there a look that your dog or cat is going to give you? Um, not always. So don't always look for a look. Um, if you have a dog with mobility issues, if you have a lab with mobility issues or a golden retriever, they never have a bad day. Those two breeds, they have like a joy gene. And so if you could have a dog with really bad hips and they could barely sit down or lay down, um, it's, it's, uh, they're, they're not going to give you a look because they're also going to eat. They're going to wag their tail. However, with that being said, <clears throat> if you're looking for a look, then you're looking for a look of suffering. And so this is my own cat. 
Kirby, who had a primary lung tumor. And on the day he passed, here he is sitting on my chest on the right. And um, dare I say, he gave me a look. He w it was not happy. And to this day, I regret waiting so long that I was waiting for a look. So again, even as a veterinarian, it's not easy for me to always see things because I wanted him to live forever, right? So, um, so don't just wait for a look. Now, there's a couple of different ways to um, evaluate quality of life on a more objective uh, uh, set of scales out there. And we have these on our website, lapalove.com. And there's also others out there um, to, to look at. So a couple of people will say, hey, you know what? Find out the five top five things a pet loves to do. And when he stops doing three of them, then you know his time. And that's not a wrong answer. Um, however, sometimes they'll still do those things that they love to do, even with the disease that they have. So, um, you know, maybe your dog has cognitive dysfunction. So half the day they're in this zombie-like state when the other half of the day they're still doing the things that they love. Uh, what I like to do is add something that they hate to that five. So this is Duncan and he is looking for the Goodyear blimp, which flew by his house twice a day and he protected his family from the Goodyear blimp. So here he is looking for it and he hated that Goodyear blimp with a passion. So as soon as he heard the motor coming, he would start to bark at the, at the Goodyear blimp. So um, I said, hey dad, when he stops caring to be a warrior against the Goodyear blimp, maybe that's one of his five to look at. Um, there's uh, the five freedoms, which is on the ASPCAPro.org website and this is Freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, and disease, freedom to express normal behavior, and freedom from fear and distress. And so you can go to their website and just kind of look at more information on, on these, on these um, five freedoms. I like counting good days versus bad days. However, you must, as a team, as a family, decide what is a good day. So what does a good day look for Duncan versus a bad day? And that is going to go along with his ailment, with the personality, and all those other things that we talked about. So um, what I like for children is to get uh, a jar of coins. So you could put and put a label on it, good day and bad day. And when they've had a good day, again, going over what your parameters are for a good versus bad, put a penny in, a good, in the good jar. And after a month or two months, what jar is more full? That can help you make that decision. Also on our website, we've got a, a calendar, which um, just a blank calendar, and you can put a big red X over the bad days. Or maybe uh, if you want to be more uh, glass half full kind of girl, then you can put a big smiley face on the good days. But if you start to track this, because it is hard to measure what you don't monitor, right? And if we're measuring quality of life, then we need to put it on something for all of us to see. And I like to put it on a refrigerator. So in this example, this family was doing X's by all the bad days. And on a quick glance, this looks like 50-50. So to me, if, if they say we want more good days than bad, then, then we're coming close. <clears throat> but what I also see is a trend. I don't know if you guys see this, but look at the Friday. So maybe you'll say, uh-oh, what's going on with Friday? And in this case, the garbage truck came every Friday morning. And that just worked up this dog so much into a tizzy that he was then panicked the whole rest of the day. He hurt himself because he was, you know, skidding on the tile floor. And so his Fridays were really bad and the family would come home and they wouldn't understand what's going on until we realized, aha, it's that garbage truck. So you can even learn some patterns by doing these. We created an app at Lapa Love called Gray Muzzle, and this is an app that you can download on your phone for uh, Apple or Android. Just go to your store and look for Gray Muzzle. And what this allows you to do is create a profile for your pet, and then simply, super easy, say well, today was a good day, neutral or bad. But again, you must, you must define what a good day is versus a bad day. Is it that he slept all night? Is it that he you know, walked uh, around the block? Whatever that may be, it's so different. But um, this will give you a quick glance um, to, to see what percentage that they're doing good, bad, or even neutral. Now you have to be honest, right? So a lot of us don't like to be honest when we're doing these things. Um, so you have to make sure that, that that's why defining what the good and the bad is, is really helpful. There's another quality of life scale that we have on our website, which looks at mobility, nutrition, hydration, attitude, and elimination. And we ask you to give a score zero through two on each of these categories. And then we'll add them up. And so if your pet is nine or above, then, then he's okay. Um, if it's five or below, then maybe intervention is, is best. And this is just one way to, to help um, just put things on paper. One of my fr good friends who's a hospice veterinarian up in Canada, her quality of life scale actually measures, do the, does your pet give love or take love? So again, this is not, you know, let's say a scientifically, you know, uh, um, correct way to do this, but this is, there is no science behind this. Some of it comes from the heart. This is a family uh, in, uh, that I helped, 
in California where we just put giant post-it notes on the wall and they had to write um, how their pet did. Did he sleep through the night? Did he, how much drugs he needed to keep him comfortable? And so this was Bogey, a golden retriever that had cancer. And so everybody in the family could see this every single day to see how well he did. That way everybody was united. Because that's another problem that we see is that not everybody in the family is, is, is in agreement. And that's sad to see. So if we can get behind measuring um, and, and putting a diary, then, then together as a family, we can make the best decision. We also created something called the PetHospiceJournal.com. And this is a, a much more advanced version of a, of a hospice um, profiling system. And this allows you also to upload pictures, which is really great to see before, I don't want to say before and after, but kind of before and after. So this is Andy, and he was a patient of mine in hospice, where um, on the right-hand side, you could see where he was sleeping, how, how much muscle mass he lost. And the owners are like, wow, I didn't actually notice how skinny he became until I looked at his, at his pictures from just a few years earlier. So look at pictures from a year ago or two years ago. And, and listen, I've changed in the past few years. <laughs> My favorite thing of all time is to make bucket lists. And so this is uh, Eddie and Eddie's bucket list. I have to go through it because it is my favorite. Um, so uh, it's, um, he wanted to make sure he had pizza and ice cream, snuggle with mom and dad on weekend mornings, find a new park and take a walk, cast a paw print, do a doggy photo shoot, go on a hike with grandma and grandpa, breakfast in bed with dad, smiley face, steak dinner, throw a birthday party. I guess Emily was out, so she couldn't, she wasn't invited. Uh, <laughs> a uh, sunbathing in the, and a picnic in the park and a bonus ride in the fire truck. So Eddie's family made all the things that made Eddie happy. And then, you know, I want you to think about this. When it came time to say goodbye to Eddie, did they have any regrets? And that answer is no. They knew that they did the very best for Eddie. They wanted to make sure he had all his happy things before they had to say goodbye and send him on his next adventure. And when you do these things, it can actually put a little perspective to of what makes Eddie, Eddie. You know, what makes Duncan, Duncan? There's a place called Denial Island. I have been the governor of, of Denial Island, so welcome if you're there, okay? Many of us have been there. It is the worst decision you'll ever have to make, and I promise you that you are not going to have um, clear vision on this. You might be on Denial Island or simply with Denial Goggles. So this is Darby. Uh, sorry, Darby's actually mother is the one who told me that she was on Denial Island, and she said, I have given, I've done your scale, and I gave Darby an excellent and clearly she's not excellent and I have denial goggles on. Can you help me do the quality of life scale? So that's where the, a lap of love, sometimes you do need an outside person to help you and that's what we can help you with and even your veterinarian. So go ask your veterinarian to help you with these things. Go on our website for resources or some, there's some other great ones out there as well. Now, what about Duncan? Is it time for Duncan? And I want you to think about all that we've talked about, whether, you know, what his ailment is like. And he's got the one that's got respiratory distress as, as so he's an eminent. Um, <clears throat> he's, he's now got a lot of appetite issues. He's, you know, urinating on himself. So there's a lot going on with poor little Dunk. Now, Duncan's family had a previous experience with their last Doberman. So they loved Doberman. And uh, his, their first Doberman was named Neo. And uh, he had an adrenal tumor, so uh, something called Cushing. So it was an adrenal tumor, which then spread to his uh, liver. So he had cancer in his liver. And they did chemo, and he lived a wonderful about 11 months, I think. And one day, they came home. And, you know, again, we all, we all hope that our pet will die in their sleep. They don't always die in their sleep. And the way they die, if we're not home, can be very traumatic to them. Well, the family of Neo came home and, and they had to put him in a hallway, as you see here on the left, because he would pee so much from his disease that they, when they were not home, they blockaded him in a little hallway so that way they could kind of keep the, the pee in one spot, if you will, with all those towels. One day, day they came home at two o'clock in the afternoon and he, was, and he had passed without them there. And they said, we do not ever not want to be present and say goodbye. We want a peaceful euthanasia. We want to make sure that he's not feeling any pain or anxiety. And we would, don't ever want to have that happen again. So it's a little bit of the emotional budget like we talked about. And so they, they did not want that to happen to, to Duncan. Now, Duncan's family is dealing with a lot. So these are his pills. And this is including his arthritis pills, also his heart medicine. And so um, these are, this is two weeks supply. And so we had to take pills four times a day. So we had morning, noon, evening, and bedtime. So this is a lot of pills. And Duncan's not eating all, not taking his pills well. 
So Duncan's dad is the primary caregiver, like I mentioned. And so one day he texted mom when she was traveling and he said, Duncan is not eating in a day and a half now. And I'm really tired of trying to figure out what to do. Cat food, meat cubes, pill pockets. I have filled them the last nine times. And now today, it looks like I'm gonna to have to do it all again. So this is not the warrior that he wanted for his boy. He's trying to pill him to give him drugs that will sustain his life and he's not wanting them and he does not want to continue to keep trying because that's not what he wanted for his boy. And I could understand that as a veterinarian. I really truly did. However, the problem was is that Duncan was my boy. So I was Duncan's mom. And if love alone could have saved him, he would have still been here today. And so I did everything I could for him. I wanted to make sure he was on the best medications. I wanted to make sure he saw the specialist, the best specialist in Southern California, which he did. He had his own minivan. <laughs> he had everything. However, I could not, not fix his heart. And so one day, dad called me and I was traveling, just like I am today traveling. And he said, he's not, he's not doing well and you need to come home and help him. So I flew home urgently. And so we made Duncan his own bucket list, and that's to enjoy a steak dinner. He had three of them. We did a slumber party. He had visits from his, his human girlfriends, soaking up the sun, chasing people off his property like a warrior, barking at nothing important, peeing on the neighbor's plants, having an in-and-out party, snuggling with mom and dad in bed, lots of kisses from us. He even made a new friend, and he chased the mail truck the day before he passed. And so my grief will always be here, but I have no regrets. So two years ago, no, no, sorry, a year and a half ago, I said goodbye to my boy. And he's an angel now, but I will miss him dearly. So there's so much to this assessing quality of life. And I hope this just gave you a few things to help you through, the, through this process. And know that Nobody knows the right answer. There is no right or wrong. There's, there's sometimes the best for your pet, the best for you. What I don't want is your pet to actively suffer or for you guys to actively suffer. And I know that those going through this, I know it far too well what it's like to say goodbye. And, you know, I, I say we only borrow them from heaven and we got to give them back. So I hope this was helpful. And Abby, if there's, I have a few minutes time for some questions that might be helpful. Oh. Dr. Mary, I'm trying so hard to not cry right now, so um, <laughs> I apologize. My voice is cracking, um, and you guys, I knew how this was going to end, but I still <laughs> choked up, um, so thank you so much for giving us, you know, some objective tools to use um, with, you know, with also our emotions and everything. I, I yeah. just thinking back on my own pets and my neighbor just went through this. I feel like it, it is, you know, it helps some a little bit at least. And, and I think that's what we're always all looking for. Yeah. Um, so if you guys have questions, type them in the chat box. Um, someone did ask about the hydration piece you were talking yes. about. I think it was about quality of life. Cause you were talking about like sub Q fluids and stuff like yep. that. So if you could just go over that piece again. Um, yeah, no, that's okay. So there are some diseases which, um, which we as veterinarians will suggest doing sub-Q fluids. Kidney failure is the, the best example. Um, so if your veterinarian does, does suggest uh, sub-Q fluids, uh, that's, that's something you could do. It's um, be mindful of that because um, sometimes, and a lot of times it's to kitty cats, they don't like, they, they, they may not like it. So what I don't want you to do is ever ruin your human animal bond. So you could also see if maybe a technician will come to your house to help you through that managing that at home and teaching you in the home because us teaching you in a clinic is very different than being in the home and, and learning how best to do it. I had a cat named Bodhi and I had to give him sub Q foods and it was very helpful for him. He felt much better just because the kidneys um, were not functioning well. So he kept getting dehydrated himself and he couldn't even drink enough to help keep his hydration. So that's the thing. It's different when they're sick and they don't want to drink versus the disease he has is, is, um, is, is not allowing him to keep his hydration status well. There is some studies though in human hospice where they actually, it hurts to give them too much hydration. So just be mindful of that and, and working with your veterinarian. Okay, so we have just a couple of other questions um, and I might turn it over to Amanda here. So this one is a, a little bit specific, but still applicable to what you said. You mentioned okay. dementia. 
Um, and someone oh. asked if it's only bad at night where I'm oh. Great question. Okay. I hate the dementia problems out there and I wish, and this is in humans too. It is such an epidemic. Um, and, and I mean, hate with like, Oh, I wish we had a cure. Right. So, um, I get it. My cat Bodie, my cat Bodie actually had dementia. So we don't just see it in dogs. We see it in cats too, everybody. Um, but, uh, they could just be, it's less, let's say obvious in a cat. So it is not just at night. However, there is something called the sundowner syndrome. So we do see it more. Um, some of those symptoms may, may, uh, may present itself more at night. Just, and who knows if it's, you know, the, just the hormone levels in our, in our bodies as it changes throughout the day, melatonin levels change also throughout the day. So what we do see is that they will do more at night, but I have helped pets that all 24 hours they're going through this anxiety, panting and pacing. My cat Bodhi, he did the worst sound and I'm going to do it for everybody. So it, and that was usually at two o'clock in the morning. Um, uh, just something to think about though, uh, is to make sure if your cat is and dogs too, if they're, they're having this, Go to the veterinarian though, because um, it could, it could, I don't want to say just be cognition because cognition is hard. Um, but I would always want to check their blood pressure as well as look for any uh, urinary tract infections or UTIs because a urinary tract infection could actually exacerbate the signs of cognitive dysfunction. So if you see that your dog or cat is having more of these things, it, it may be something that we could help treat first. And then, you know, we're, they still have dementia, but it's a little bit better. I wish. I wish I saw these fa these families way sooner than I do at Lapa Love. So if people ask me, Mary, why you know, are, aren't you depressed? Are, are your doctors depressed? You know, euthanizing pets for for a living? Dare I say? And I say no because I, I go to homes and I see families that love their pets, and I see pets that are that are ready. They're ready. Their bodies are ready. Um, their families may not be ready, but their their bodies are. And so I can release that suffering. I can release the pain that they're in. And so I, I feel that I've done, I've, done, um, I've done good, if you will. What, I, what bothers me, though, is when I go to a home and they say, and 35% have not seen their doctor in over three years, and, and I think we could have done something. So please go see our veterinarian before, before, as soon as you start seeing signs, right? Like Duncan, he had a little tickle in his throat. I see dogs that have LARPAR, this laryngeal paralysis, all the time. And they're like, oh, well, I just thought he had an old croaky voice, right? And I'm like, no, this is laryngeal paralysis. So if we see the pet sooner, we can actually start putting him on maybe a different type of food, which has some um, brain nutraceuticals involved. We could put them on some medications to help them with the anxiety. We could put them on some um, pain management. And the sooner we see them, they actually, it's been proven that they not only live better, but they actually live longer. That was a long answer. I'm sorry, Abby. <laughs> <laughs> It's Amanda now. I'm going to finish oh, up for okay. Abby. So okay. um, there's a couple questions that seem to relate about aftercare for humans after a pet's euthanasia. Do you recommend support groups? Do oh. you have resources for families um, yes. for after euthanasia? Oh, that's a great one, Amanda. So yes. And, and, you know, first off, I want you to know that you are not alone. If you need support, um, it is the, the, you know, our pets are a part of our family. Our pets are our life witness to things. They are, the, you know, the, the sole living thing in our home with us. Sometimes they're our protector and losing that is way more, way more than just losing a dog or a cat. Right. And so if anybody says that to you, that's, that's, that's almost cruel. Um, and so if you need support, there is um, some great resources on our website for, uh, for, for pet loss. Even if you are in an area that we service at Lapa Love, on that area page, we'll actually see local, if there is one, a local uh, pet loss group. They're not, they're not always out there though, right? In, in specific areas. So some online information will be available um, if, there is, if there is one in the group, but just in general, we have up on our menu bar some, some resources. There's some great books um, out there as well, which is, which is on our website. And also we have some books for children because children may have a tough time going through this. And I have to tell you, children being present for euthanasia, I actually encourage. They're, they're amazing. They say the most amazing things. Um, sometimes sometimes uh, uh, teenagers can be a more of a challenge than the youngers, but, <laughs> but there's some good information on pet loss uh, there as well. And you know what? Sometimes just memorializing your pet um, is a helpful way uh, through the grieving process. So, you know, we always do paw impressions, of course, at an appointment and I'm wearing a necklace. I took a picture of my palm impression and had it made into a necklace. 
um, and <clears throat> you know, just making a, 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 I don't want to say a coffee table book, but a coffee table book with all the pictures of your pet story. Um, it, you know, there's, there's ways that just going through those pictures to make that book can be very therapeutic. Um, and even for me with, with Neo, my first Doberman who died of cancer, I got very involved with the canine cancer group and started to do canine cancer walks. And I just felt like in his name, I was able to do something. So don't feel alone if you feel like you need to get help. Yes, and um, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. I was going to say, I think related to that, also someone asked if Lap of Love ever works specifically with a veterinary social worker. Oh, so that's interesting. We actually do have on our staff a uh, a counselor who is available. So, uh, so we have one uh, uh, um, on our staff, uh, and then within a specific area. Uh, some of us veterinarians, if there is a, a social worker in the area, we, we will know of them. They're not always available. With that being said, a, a grief counselor um, who deals with, I don't want to say regular grief because that sounds like pet loss is not regular grief, but just to think outside the box, everybody, a counselor who deals with grief, uh, pet loss grief is, is in that category. So you could also see, see them. Um, and the last question I think that I'm seeing is kind of more specific about um, panting. How do you know if panting is from pain or dementia? Oh, that's a good one. So um, first I would rule out the things that would cause pain from the, remember there's the three kinds of pain and I'm going to, this is a great question. So that the pain like arthritis, we would need to do um, an exam. So your veterinarian could take some x-rays to make sure that there is no arthritis. Um, Maybe even a even just a physical exam, they're going to feel we we feel for things, so we will feel kind of crunchiness in your you know in your dog's joints. We'll feel for edema or swelling, uh, heat. So we're going to actually look for evidence of pain or a disease. Even even sometimes um, panting could be something going wrong in the lungs. So if you've got heart disease like Duncan, right, or or if you've got a lung tumor taking x-rays, we need to see that because the panting could be because they don't have good air exchange. So panting is, is pain. Panting could be from some of our drugs that we give can actually cause panting. Uh, maybe it's, it's a problem with the respiratory system and then also uh, uh, dementia. So um, your veterinarian can help you figure out um, or at least rule out things. With that being said, I do believe dementia is a part of the pain, um, one of the three categories, if they're having anxiety from it. There are some dogs that I see that are that is in a dem dementia state where they're just staring in a corner and I don't know if they're in pain. I, a doctor, do not know if they're in pain. They're just standing there. However, I see way too many dogs though panting and pacing uncontrollably. Um, there is some wonderful Facebook groups out there. Ah, I'm trying to think of the name. I'm a part of it, but it's the Canine Cognitive Dysfunction Facebook group. There are fantastic support group. So please go there if your dog has it. Um, and I see so many videos there and it's just, it's sad to see. Um, with, with, with either case though, your veterinarian can, pre can prescribe some good medication. So whether it's anti-anxiety or anti-pain medi medication. Um, but you know what, tracking this, tracking the symptoms that your pet has, tracking what time of day could also be helpful. Um, there's some good apps out there to do that. Babble Bark is one app that um, is great to, to use just writing it down in a diary. So, um, and that may also help your veterinarian narrow down uh, what the cause is. And just to wrap up, it seems like a few people are asking about resources, resources personally for themselves with grief counseling, resources for shelters and shelter systems. Oh. So can you give oh. a quick summation of resources and where to find them? Okay. Oh my gosh. Yes. So um, on our website, we do have a resources page for pet loss. So we have a pet loss resources page on our website at lapoflove.com. Um, we also have web uh, resources for different, different diseases that pet dogs and cats will go through. So just some information on cognitive dysfunction, um, things like that. If the, the shelter question, that must be from somebody who works at a, at a shelter. That's very hard. Yep, I, I believe so. Yeah, that, let me tell you something. I worked at the Humane Society of Broward County and that's hard. Um, and I, I salute everybody who works at shelters because we unfortunately have, um, you know, even in a no-kill shelter, sometimes a pet will get sick. So maybe they're not um, behaviorally, you know, they're aggressive or we just run out of space. 
So um, even healthy pets sometimes will have to be euthanized. And that's, it's very hard for the shelter workers. I have done, I have been asked to speak specifically at shelters. Um, it's usually because volunteers may not understand why we have to say goodbye. And that's, and it's very hard for veterinarians and technicians to get, to not have the support of the whole team. Nobody, nobody wants to do this. Nobody wants to euthanize healthy animals, right? But, but yet, yeah, and then to have volunteers maybe give a little bit of lashback or the community, it's tough. And so we have to support each other. And, um, uh, so I have actually just gone and spoken at some at some shelters, but I don't know of any other specific rep, uh, resources. I don't know if that was helpful. Well, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great place to start. And it sounds like your website and that resources page would definitely be a, a great place for people to look. Okay, awesome, great. Well, I hope this was helpful for your for everybody that was on. Yes, thank you so much for speaking with us, and um, I hope everybody has enjoyed it. We're definitely recording it, and we'll post it to YouTube and send that link out just as soon as we can. And thank okay. you so much awesome. for joining us. You're welcome. Take care, everybody. Have a great day. Okay, bye. Bye.